this printmaking became my language. Hers was quilting. And this became my language. It became my turn to tell the stories. Print friends, and welcome to the 43rd episode of Pine Copper Lime, the internet's number one printmaking podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. I release weekly podcasts with people in the print world who are doing something a bit beyond the expected. So please subscribe on your podcast listening app of choice. You can find Pine Copper Lime on Patreon, Instagram, Facebook, and you can sign up for our monthly newsletter with print news from around the world at pinecopperlime.com. Printmaking forever, shun the non-believers. My guest this week is Delita Martin. She joined me from her Texas studio in the middle of a thunderstorm to talk about her large-scale prints with which she mixes drawing, sewing, and collage in an exploration of sisterhood among women of color and her thoughts on the spirit world. She's the owner of Black Box Press Studio, founded in Little Rock, Arkansas in 2008, and has exhibited widely throughout the United States and internationally. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and prepare to get spiritual with Delita Martin. Hi, Delita. How's it going? Hi, how are you? I'm really good. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. How is your quarantine going? Wow. Well, it's, it's making me more productive, even more productive than usual, I should say. So it hasn't been bad. Um, you know, other, I think every, every artist that I've spoken with has been dealing with the whole sleepless issue, you know, waking mm-hmm. up in the middle of the night, going into the studio. So other than that, it's been, it's been fine. It's probably a, very akin to my usual life. <laughs> I don't think changed actually yeah I've definitely heard artists particularly artists such as yourself with a home studio just say I don't know that my life's all that different but yeah I've been getting the up in the middle of the night thing too I don't know what that's about but between two and three at some point I'll wake up every night three o'clock is my hitting point I wake up at three and it's like okay I'm not gonna go to the studio I'm not gonna go to the studio (laughs) and then I end up in the studio so I decided to just stop fighting it. <laughs> Definitely. Just like get get the hours in when you can. So I I know your work just kind of from around the print world and your presence in it and you know seeing your work at SGCI and just kind of, you know, and I think we've got mutual friends as well. Um but for people who aren't familiar with you, um, just to give a little bit of background, would you mind telling people who you are, where you are, and what you do? Sure, no problem. Well, I actually came to printmaking really late. So I did my undergraduate degree at Texas Southern University in Houston, Texas. Um, And it was in drawing. And so, um, you know, I, I didn't have an opportunity really to experience printmaking in undergraduate because we didn't have enough students to make the class. So I'd seen the process, but I wasn't really quite sure. I was very fascinated. So it was kind of one of those things that I put in the back of my head to try later. So I decided after graduating, a few years after graduating, I decided I wanted to go back to school, get my MFA. And what made sense to me was, was printmaking, Mm -hmm. you know, and I know it's not true, but in my mind, I felt like I had taken drawing as far as I could. And it's totally not true. It was all in my head, but (laughs) printmaking seemed like the natural next step. It was like, you know, drawing using different materials and different surfaces, but it was very much akin to drawing to me. So it was just a natural flow into that. So I, you know, went to school to get my um, MFA from Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. 
And um, I started making prints in 2006 mm. was my first, first time I, I experienced printmaking. And so from there, um, my, we moved to, from Indiana, we actually moved to Little Rock, Arkansas. And I started teaching at the University of Arkansas in Little Rock. And I was teaching um, basic drawing and intro to art history. And, you know, after working there for about three or four years, I was like, you know what? I really want to go back in the studio and just be a full-time artist. And my husband was so supportive and he was just like, you know, do it now while you can. He's like, one or two things is going to happen. Either, you know, you're going to have some really great stories to tell our grandkids or you're going to live your dream. And so he's like, do it while we can. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And it was probably one of the hardest, but one of the best decisions I ever made in my entire life. It was so scary, but um, I'm glad I did. And so I handed in my resignation and came into the studio. So the heart, so after that, I think it just became, how do I make this a job? You know? And it's, you know, there's no blueprint for artists, you know, other, you know, fields of study have, you know, you, you go to school, you get your degree, you do your internship and, you know, you follow the, the ladder and with art, you know, you have to be as creative as possible, even in terms of what your job looks like. So I spent about a year trying to figure that out and, and along the way, I felt guilty making prints because I love drawing and I felt a little guilty because I love painting too, but I don't consider myself a painter. And so I just got in the studio and started challenging myself and was like, how do I um, marry all of these processes that I love together to create these, you know, works that I love? And so that's what I did. Yeah, beautiful. And now you've you've left Arkansas and you're in Houston now, correct? Yes, um, we moved to, back to Houston. I'm originally from Texas. We moved back to Houston about five years ago and um, built a studio. Black Box Press um, actually got its official home here. And um, I've been making prints ever since. And so you said you grew up in Texas. Yeah, I actually grew up in Conroe, Texas, which is 45 miles north of Houston, right between Houston and Dallas. Okay. Yeah, so um, it was really interesting coming home. I hadn't been home in, I left Texas in 2002. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't come back until 2014. So it was, you know, really interesting. Yeah, I bet. Did you find this changed a bit in 14 years? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it it has. It, it's changed, but it's still good. I mean, the art community here is amazing. They're so supportive. Um, it was really great when I called all my friends and was like, hey, I'm coming back. And they were like, this is wonderful. So, um, you know, it was wonderful coming back. So I, I feel like I have two homes now because <laughs> it's like I still love going to Arkansas and, and, you know, hanging out with artist friends there and working on projects there as well as here. I know that um, Texas is so supportive of the arts, and I've heard so many great stories from artists who were there and how, you know, people there, there really is a sense of philanthropy that you don't get other places where people will show up and buy art from artists to support them and that the community is really strong. And I just, I love that. And it really, it really intrigues me to spend more time in Texas. I've only been there for conferences here and there. But I'd love to hear a little bit about the art community in Arkansas, because I feel like you don't hear about art in Arkansas nearly as much. Well, it's really surprising. Um, Upon moving to Arkansas, I never thought Arkansas honestly was not on my radar. Mm -hmm. And um, we've lived several places and I was like, we're moving to Arkansas. Are you kidding me? But I, I, I moved there and I fell in love and the art community is equally as supportive and there's a lot going on, which Mm. is so surprising. You wouldn't think that so much would be going on in the arts. Um, Right now they're working on um, building an arts district in Little Rock within the city limits and which is great. There's just so many opportunities. There's Crystal Bridges, the museum there. 
some reason I didn't realize Crystal Bridges was there. I've known of it. I think I've even sold work to them before, <laughs> but I didn't, for some reason I didn't make that connection. Oh, interesting. Okay. Huge, huge art community. Um, and really that's where my career, I would say, took off was actually through Crystal Bridges through the state of the arts exhibition. Um, the first exhibition that they had, um, it was just, it was incredible. Um, being able to um, work with a museum to, and, and what they did was really, they took a lot of emerging artists, mid-career artists, and put us on a stage in front of an audience that we may not have ordinarily had an opportunity to um, to show our work to. And that was just incredible that, who I mean, who would have thought Arkansas yeah. would have done it? But, but, it, but it happened. I love that. Like, I really do... I'm intrigued by like the pockets of art support in the states that don't mm -hmm. get enough fanfare because I think that particularly young artists growing up, they have this idea that I have to move to New York or LA and if I can't make it in either one of those towns, then I have to go be a manager at Starbucks. <laughs> and it's totally not true because I, I had no idea that the arts were so strong in Arkansas. Um, the artists are absolutely incredible. They're so supportive. Um, the organizations are supportive, the um, museums and the galleries. I mean, it's just, it's an incredible network. And you would have, you, who would have thought in yeah. Arkansas? But yeah. you know, it's, it's great. It's, um, like I said, I've lived a lot of places and it's one of the few places in which I actively keep in touch with the people there because it's, they're so wonderful. I mean, you can't go there and spend any time there and not yeah. fall in love. How do you walk into a grocery store and come out with dinner plans with, with a stranger? <laughs> and it doesn't even happen. It's like, but that was my experience in Arkansas. It's like you, you go into the grocery store, you come out with dinner plans with a total stranger. And um, it was wonderful. And, and I still go back every, every chance I get. That's really wonderful. Yeah. And I think that a lot of the time it is those small communities where you do get that genuine support where if, you know, you go to a city like New York and you're just this tiny little fish that it's this like two second size up. Can you do anything for me? You can't. Next, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a wonderful community. It was, um, it always surprised people when I say that my career really got started in Arkansas and, and they're like, what, can you tell us that story? How did that happen? <laughs> so that's usually the response yeah. I get, but yeah, totally surprised at how amazing the art community is there. That's so good to know. So was art a big part of your life growing up when you were in Texas? Did you always draw? Did you go to museums? Oh, absolutely. So mm. I started drawing probably about four that I, I actually have my first, I, I guess I consider it my real drawing from four. And um, I knew in kindergarten, I was going to be an artist. I mm. had no clue what that meant. <laughs> but I'm going to be an artist. And I, I always say that I grew up in an art school because it was great. Um, my father was a painter. He built furniture. Um, my grandparents, grandmothers were quilt makers. We have lots of writers in our family. So mm -hmm. creating was just really an everyday occurrence. It was so natural in our household. So I always tell people I grew up in an art school. I grew up in an art <laughs> I love it. Always encouraged to create. And when I was, in, when my parents would introduce me to people, they're like, oh, you know, this is my youngest daughter. This is my baby. She's an artist. And they would always follow up with she's an artist. So, of course, you know, at five or six, it's like, I'm an artist. <laughs> That's what I do. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's like always been your identity. It's then. always been my identity. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I say I'm so glad that it worked out because there was never a plan B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I think so. I've heard some people say before that that's sometimes the best way to guarantee success is actually don't have a plan b yeah. you know it's just it's it's like the um you know like the 
Roman generals who would who would set up their troops so they were fighting with a cliff behind them so they couldn't run away, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, I um, so I grew up drawing. It really started off with like coloring books, and my stepfather would buy me coloring books every week. I would get two new coloring books, and then I began to copy the images in the coloring books. And um, I don't think I, I don't think I really understood that my father was an artist until I was probably around 10 or so and we mm -hmm. would draw pictures together I would watch him paint and you know we would have our drawing sessions in the evenings um but it really hit me around 10 maybe 11 that wow my father's an artist he's a painter and so mm -hmm. that was um pretty amazing when I realized what was happening but I didn't um I didn't go to museums until college Really? Hmm. Yeah, that was my first um, museum experience was in undergrad. Yeah, I think kids in general, it's funny how we never know until we're like a bit older, the kind of remarkable elements of our growing up, yeah. because it's just normal. You just, you know, you assume that everyone's parents are like your parents, everyone's siblings are like your siblings. And then when you get a little bit older and you have these moments where you're like, oh, not everyone's dad's a painter. <laughs> exactly. And that's how it was because there was, I was always around someone who was creating something. They were writing mm -hmm. stories. They were making quilts. They were sewing clothing. Um, they were telling stories. Um, so it was just natural to create. And I was mm -hmm. always encouraged to create. I'd love to chat about your particular distinctive style of your work because you have a really established, developed aesthetic. And I think that a lot of artists, particularly artists who are just starting to explore what they want to make and what they want their voice to look like, finding that can be a little bit of a mystery sometimes, I think, for them. You know, like, how do I just, how do I define what's mine? Um, and you have such a beautiful, such a distinctive aesthetic in your work. I'd love to hear you talk about how you kind of came from, you know, studying printmaking and then, you know, getting this experience in Arkansas with your career. At what point did that develop and how did you sort of find your voice? Wow. That's a really interesting story. So, um, I had my first critique at 12. <laughs> Dr. John T. Biggers, who actually founded our art department, Texas Southern University, who my father studied under, he came home, he was like, pack your stuff, um, you know, I want you to meet someone. And so meeting uh, Dr. Biggers, he looked at my little drawings that I had, and he was like, oh, you already developed your style. And I had no idea what that meant. But over the years, I've always been taught, um, with my father studying with Dr. Biggers, I grew up with his philosophy in terms of art. And it's always been, you know, always whatever feels right to your spirit, to your soul, that's what you're supposed to do. And so um, my mentor, Harvey Johnson, who always, who also studied with Dr. Biggers, he, he told me, he says, if your soul tells you to paint apples, for two years, that's what you're supposed to do, that there's a message in that somewhere and there's a lesson for you in that somewhere. And so I've always, um, I've always done that. And so I think probably around um, maybe my second year, third year in undergrad, I started to critique my work and look at my work and I realized that I was drawing women and was um, drawing young girls. And so I had to start asking myself questions. Um, why is this important? Why am I doing this? You know, what does this really mean? And um, I started noticing objects showing up in my work. And I was like, I had to ask those, those questions, those self-evaluating questions of why are you doing this? And just having those personal conversations. And I've continued to do that throughout my career. And I think that um, has helped me to develop you know, my style or develop, you know, the way I work in terms of work. And I always tell people I became a real artist when I stopped, I guess, metaphorically apologizing for what I do. 
And so, you know, some people like my work. Um, I'm sure there's some out there that don't. Or, you know, some people that, you know, question my aesthetics. And, and that's fine. Um, but it's important for me to be true to what I believe. Um, me to be true to the work that I produce, the work that I create. And I think that that is what helps you to develop yourself as an artist. Yeah, that's really, really beautiful. I think it's interesting, too, the way you're talking about how you got there. It was almost like you were an observer, like you're this, like the vehicle. And you sort of said, like, I've noticed that this is what I was doing. Well, I am, you know, the I created my work, I'm, I'm responsible for them. I'm responsible for their story. And so I am, I am merely a vessel. And when I come into the studio, I work as intuitively as possible. And I come in and I'll say, you know what? I think I want to work with the color blue today. And that's about mm -hmm. as much as I get in terms of painting. Or, you know what? I think I want to do a full body image. Or maybe I'll work with a portrait. But beyond that, the work tells me what it needs. It tells me what direction to go in. I work in layers and every layer dictates what happens in the next layer. And so mm -hmm. it took a while. It was very difficult for me at first to be able to work in a way to separate the layers and um, be able to at the same time marry them all together. That took a lot of work. I don't think I was able to really develop that until graduate school only because I didn't understand what I was doing until graduate school, at least that portion of what I was doing. So um, that kind of took a while <laughs> to get. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I, um, I, I come in and they tell me who they are. And when they tell me who they are, that's when the process stuff begins. And when you're talking about working in layers, you, cause you, you know, you use printmaking Mm -hmm. um, and you are a printmaker, but you don't just use the medium as well because you paint and draw. Um, right. Would you talk a little bit actually just to your process of, of building up the layers with the different media? Well, that, so shortly after I left the University of Arkansas, I was really scared. You know, I was really, really nervous. And I was like, A, I had so many things going on. I was like, how do I make this into a job? That was mm. number one. How do I develop a studio practice? Um, and I wanted to challenge myself. So I wanted to challenge myself in terms of size, because at that time I was working 22 by 30 was like the largest size that I worked. And you go to school and you're told you're a printmaker. So you make prints, you're a mm -hmm. painter, you paint, you draw, mm -hmm. you draw. So I wanted to challenge all of that. And I wanted to go into the studio and not just be a printmaker, but be a creator. And so I literally had to tell myself every day, you know what? It's okay. This is your work. This is your space. This is your world. Everyone else is invited in and you don't have to just be a, you can be. Mm -hmm. anything. And so, um, I started kind of marrying the processes together and the way I thought about it was like, I would work on something and I would draw it and I'm like, you know what? That's not working let me paint it. And I was like, you know what? Painting's not working. Um, let me print it. Printing's not working. Um, let me go look at some other work I've done and I'll deconstruct that and bring it back into this work. I'll sew it into this work or I'll collide it in. And so it just became a process of being um, an artist, a real artist, a creator, and not so much thinking of yourself in terms of a printmaker or a painter or a draftswoman or any of those things. It was about creating. In terms of my process, um, I, I work with these really huge um, patterned backgrounds, which is usually um, where I start with the work. Oh. And the second step is drawing the portrait on the work. And from there, there's a push and pull that happens between the medium. So I may print next, I may, you know, paint in there. So at that point, there's just a push and pull that happens. And I'm really curious about the actual portraits themselves, because they're so distinctive. Each image you have, it really feels like you're looking into a person. And so are they 
inventions of yours? Are they people that you know? Are they people that sit for you? Do you draw from life? I'm just really like, I want to know all about how do you actually come to make these super engaged, beautiful portraits? So when I initially started drawing the portraits, which from day one has always been um, pretty much an invention, an invention Mm -hmm. that they were a compilation of many different women. They were my mother, my grandmother, my aunts, the lady down the street, um, you know, someone that I met that I was really taken by. Um, They were all of these women. They were the great mother icon, you know, this just the just the great mother icon. So they were just many different women. And so I referred to them as spirit women. And so upon moving back to Houston, I hadn't been home for a very long time. And I began to kind of think about the relationships that I had with my siblings, with my mother, you know, with my friends. And I was like, I became very curious about bringing actual portraiture into my work because prior mm-hmm. to that I had no, I, and I still really don't have any interest in portraiture in the traditional sense. And I'll tell you a really short little story. I, I went to an, we, an undergrad, I went to an artist's home to visit and um, she had this portrait on her wall of her, so a portrait of her that was done by Dr. Biggers. Portrait looked nothing like her at all. But when you saw it, you instantly knew it was her because he had captured her spirit. And Mm. I was interested in, I have no interest in, you know, being this, you know, hyper realist artist. I want that twinkle in your eye. I want Mm. that tilt of your head that just makes you different. I want that emotion of, you know, when you see someone that you love or when your heart is breaking, those are the moments that I'm interested in capturing in the work. I have no interest in hyper-realism. And so when I saw that portrait of her that he had done, I realized at that point, that's what I'm after. I have, you know, that's what I want to do. And so that became my focus, you know, that became me looking more closely at people and observing them. And so, you know, fast forward to now, I moved home and I what I'm working on currently is work that at its very core, my work is about identity, reconstructing identity of African American women and offering a different perspective than the negative stereotypes that we typically see in prints in you know, movies and, and, you know, paintings in the museum. I, I want to offer a different perspective. And so Every body of work that I work on is really a continuation of the body before. So it's like I think of it in terms of a conversation, a conversation that evolves over time. So I'm at the point where I'm talking about spiritual identity. How do we become a spiritual other? What does that look like? What does it look like when we're in prayer? What does it look like when we're in meditation? What does it look like when we... Um, transition into our spiritual selves. And so when you look at the pattern background, for me, that's a holding space. That's the space between the waking world and the spirit world. It's what I call the veil scape. And the women, when you see the pattern going in and out of their skin, that's how they marry into that space. That's how they become a part of that world as well as the world that that they're in. And so that became a way for me to visualize um, us in a spiritual space. And so I in that to, um, I guess, when you go into a a house or building or or a space and you get a really weird feeling, and I think it's because that's the fingerprint that we've left on that space. It's a, it's a spiritual fingerprint that's been left behind that we are reacting to. I wanted to make that visual. And so uh-huh. that's what the patterns um, in the work represent. Yeah, I'm just completely fascinated by by everything that you were, you were saying. It's, um, yeah, because I think I'd, I'd asked about, you know, just the portraits and if they were specific people 
or not. But then you got into the patterns as well, which I definitely wanted to know about as well. So that was perfect. With the, with the portraits, they a lot of them are now, but they're both. They become both. Mm-hmm. Because I am very interested in how I began to ask myself, what does it feel like to interact with the spirit world? And so mm-hmm. I three self-portraits, which I, I don't typically do self-portraits, but I did three self-portraits of me interacting in the spirit world. So there's a portrait of me transitioning into the spirit form, and there's a portrait of me, two portraits of me actually interacting, traveling, and in conversation with spirit women, which are women that I have created in the work. So it's kind of both. And actually photograph them um, to be a part of my work. I just literally work from a snapshot on my phone. Um, I don't require anything really fancy at all. Yeah. Not a photographer. Um, and I try and, and work with, like, I don't want the filtered version of people because I think we're just so beautiful as individuals. And, like, in the past, I've asked people to, um, you know, hey, can I get a pic- pic- picture of you? And it's like, I get these images and they're so heavily filtered. And I'm like, no, oh, beautiful, yeah. I like you. <laughs> so a lot of times I'll, um, I'll snap a picture of friends, you know, people I'm hanging out with and they never know. And it's like, <laughs> I want to use you in my work. And they're like, okay, well, you know, I, I can come to your studio. And no, I got you. You're good. <laughs> I've already taken what I wanted. So... So, yeah, to answer your question, they're both spirit figures and actual portraits. Mm-hmm. Am I am I hearing, is there some thunder in the background where you are? There is. Yeah. yeah, I just feel like it's just come, we just all of a sudden started talking about the spirit world, and now I've got the, like, thunder on the tape. I love it. <laughs> um, it's, no, it's, it's the perfect, it's, it's beautiful ambiance. Um, so... Yeah, I really, I know exactly what you mean when you were saying, like, when you walk into a place and you you can feel, you know, like a fingerprint, as you said, of, of something sort of maybe like emotional that happened or really highly energetic. And it's one of those things that I feel like people either get or they don't. <laughs> You're correct. I mean... Society teaches us not to um, put much stock in it. I think Mm -hmm. we still do. Children are very observant. Um, But as adults, we're jaded. (laughs) We're Mm -hmm. like, you know, we're we're instructed not to pay attention to that. You know, that's just, it's so, it's kind of taboo in a way. And um, it's very much a part of the conversation that I think is very important to have to talk about, to document, and to, um, you know, to share. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because a a lot of the conversations that I end up having, particularly with artists on on this podcast, it is about how art can get into the intuitive side of the human experience in a way that most other things can't. And we're really often taught to, particularly as people who are socialized female, to ignore the intuition, to ignore, you know, that kind of gut feeling that you have, um, because it's not that tangible, hard and fast, uh, masculine, black and white world that we're kind of trying to put, we're trying to push, push, pushed into. And, you know, there's just just so many examples of, of, you know, women having an intuition and then someone saying, you know, you're just being hysterical. You're just being, you know, all of these different things. So I just love that within your work, it's like those those two things that I'm super interested in are just like coming together. It's like that intuitive and that female experience as well that they're so wed together and they're part of what makes women so powerful I think yeah and I think for me again when I stopped when I feel like I stopped apologizing for that and Mm -hmm. that you know in a more symbolic way but when I stopped worrying about what the museums thought or what the galleries thought or what anybody thought for that matter um 
I, I always say that's when I became an artist and that's mm. my work took on um, a whole life of its own mm -hmm. you know, because I felt like I was being true to what I was supposed to be doing. I feel like I'm supposed to be documenting um, these stories. I'm supposed to be, be um, talking about this in my work. It made the work more impactful, I think. Yeah. And I've definitely heard that from from other artists that it's that when I, you know, the moment that they stopped trying to please other people, mm -hmm. all of a sudden their work got completely, you know, magnetic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, I just think there's just like such a broader life lesson in that <laughs> for just how to live, you know, um, for sure. So you said you start with the, with the patterns, but... Yeah. Where do the patterns kind of originate from? Is that also intuitive? Um, or do you draw on reference material for those? So, um, the reference material is actually um, clothing fabric, um, going to the, the fabric stores, uh, going to vintage stores. I'll actually photograph a section of a pattern. Mm -hmm. Some I combine patterns together, or if there's like a particular element of something that I want. I'll take that and I'll add it to another pattern. But um, very much um, that kind of actually goes back to quilting. Um, my mm -hmm. mother was a master and I helped her make quilts. In the evening, we would sew together. And so she would tell me stories. You know, she had my nightgown that I came home from the hospital in. Um, she kept all different types of articles of clothing and sometimes she would use them to sew and to make quilts and um, she would tell me stories and she was really putting my history in perspective, was piecing together, sewing together my history and um, who I was. So it was very, I didn't understand it at the time. I just, as a child, I enjoyed the stories. And so one day I'm in the studio and I, wanted, you know, something wasn't working out. And I was like, let me collage this in. And it just made sense to sew it in. Mm -hmm. Because it became, you know, I wanted the viewer to be able to experience what I experienced with her. And I mean, she was such a, a, an amazing storyteller. She could paint a story with her words that was just beyond any painting you could see. And I wanted to, I think that that type of storytelling she passed on to me mm -hmm. and I took up the torch this printmaking you know drawing and painting became my language hers was quilting mm -hmm. and this became my language it became my turn to tell the stories you know when I was looking at your work in preparation for our chat it made me think about how the gallery that I used to work for the owner always said I don't like to show portraiture because people don't want images of people they don't know, mm -hmm. which I never agreed with. <laughs> I was always like, I don't, I never found that to be the case. And I guess, I don't know if I've got a fully formed question, but just that kind of attitude that he had, which I didn't agree with, it made me kind of wonder, as someone who works so much in portraiture, what do you kind of hope people will get out of seeing your work? someone is walking through a gallery and they, they don't know anything about you or your, or your artist statement or anything like that, and they see your work, what in your kind of ideal world, what is it giving them? Um, I want the viewer to be able to have a conversation with the work. And when mm. they have a conversation, I mean, the work will stop you, you will look at it, and there's something in there that will cause you to pause. That's when the conversation begins. Because mm point you begin to ask questions, you begin to identify, you begin to connect or even, you know, disconnect with the work. But whatever it is, it's a good, bad or indifference is a conversation that's happening. And when that happens, I know that I've done my job. Um, I don't worry about how people receive the work. I really don't. I do feel a responsibility to um, in terms of what I put out into the into the universe yeah I'm responsible for that and as long as I feel in my heart that I've done the right thing 
I'm okay with it. What everybody else thinks, it, it kind of doesn't really matter. But I do like when people have a conversation with the work. And I don't mind people not liking the work, but let's just have an intelligent conversation about why you don't. And so I don't, I mean, and then you have to think about it too. When you think about galleries that say things like that, we're coming from two different perspectives. They're coming from a financial standpoint right. and I'm coming from a creative standpoint. And so when I run into galleries that think that way, I just know and understand that those aren't the galleries for me. Fortunately, I haven't really had that experience very much. Yeah, I think I think in this case, it was just it was always an, it, and I always felt it as um as really limiting because sometimes I'd bring an artist to them and say this, look at this beautiful work. And it would just be like, people don't like images of people they don't know. And I just was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, well, you know, I, I don't find that to be true because I'm very fascinated by portraiture. Um, I also use a lot of symbolism in my work. Um, so like growing up with my grandmother, um, she kept mason jars full of things, just stuff, buttons and um, little brooches and pins and safety pins and just all little types of nicknames. Mm. Every so often she pour this stuff out on her bed and we go through every piece one by one. And so I began to realize that objects were showing up in my work. And so I had to understand why. And I realized eventually that this was a visual language mm -hmm. and I'm using these la this language to tell stories. So for example, um, my grandmother loved birds. We always had birds at our home and we would let them out of the cages. They would fly around, they would play with us. And so the bird became the human spirit in my work. Mm. The mason jar is something that appears in my work periodically. And it talks about the idea of seeing something being contained and seeing something that you can't quite grasp, but you see it there. Mm -hmm. um, the safety pin is another symbol that I use in the work. And that talks about holding on to something or letting something go. It depends on if the pin is open or closed. So all of these domestic objects that I grew up with became language for me. Mm. And so I feel like I have been able to connect with people from all walks of life because the, the objects that I use in my work, the patterns that you see in my work are all things that people from all walks of life have at some point in time experienced. So when you walk up to, to one of my pieces and you're like, oh my God, that's a frying pan. Um, my grandmother used to have a pan like that. The conversation has started, the connection yeah. is there. And so that alone makes the work universal. Yeah, and when you were saying like the bird is as spirit, it reminded me of a conversation I was having just a couple of weeks ago with my husband. Um, and we were, we were talking about how I know in, and I'm not going to, you know, remember the, the particular tradition, but this idea that when someone in your household passes away, you, and you find, if you find a bird in your house, mm -hmm. that's them. And they've come, like, they're not quite ready to leave. And so if you find a bird in your house in those those days, you need to make sure that you get it out because it's like, it's them coming back and they're like, they're not ready. Yeah. And so, so things like that. So just the story that you just shared with me, seeing mm -hmm. my work and seeing the bird, that's something that may come to you, to mind as you're looking at the work. And it's like, your experience may not be my experience, but I'm sharing mine and you've just shared yours. So that's the conversation. Just to, to switch gears just a little bit, I love to hear you talk about Black Box Press Studio oh. and sort of the founding of that and its new home and, and that whole other side of what you do. Yeah, so um, I want to say in... 2006, um, Black Box Press became, um, I registered as an LLC, but it, again, it wasn't until, I want to say, 2013 mm -hmm. that um, 
I think I left the university around that time that I actually began to think about black box press as a business. And it's like, how do I make this function as a job, as something that I love? How do I become a full-time artist and make this work? So I, we, you know, we moved back to Houston and I had the studio built. So this is the first um, structure, black box press structure um, that was built specifically for black box press uh, came about in, I want to say 2014, maybe? No, 2015, 2015. And so um, I, you know, I've always wanted to have a space to work. So this is my dream studio. Um, I drew the plans out on the back of an envelope and gave it to the contractor and was like, can you do this? (laughs) And like, so we've added, we've had one addition on which um, we started off with, I want to say 960 square feet of just studio space, working space. And then I eventually added a gallery. So we doubled the studio space for a gallery and the gallery has since become a letterpress shop oh, really? and, okay uh, and now we're looking to add another you know space onto the studio so we want to bring the gallery back in and some mm-hmm. additional space as well so yeah so um it was creating a studio practice there's a business side of art that no one talks about and yeah. it's really hard and I felt like when I did the state of the art exhibition, I had to become a businesswoman like really, really fast. Um, it was quick, you know, so I had to think about pricing my work. I had to think about gallery representation. What was I really looking for mm-hmm. in a gallery? Um, I had to think about, um, you know, how I wanted my career to, you know, where do I see myself in five years? What does stability look like? What does longevity look like? So all of those business questions came into play and I, you know, I just had to figure it out. And it was like calling my friends, you know, in terms of, you know, what I, I, I had an exhibition where I was like, you know, I'm in this meeting and I'm told, I'm like, okay, well, what what percentage do you get of the sale of the work? And they're like, oh, no, we're renting the work from you. You know, you give us a contract and you give us the terms. And I was like, oh, okay, no problem. And I'm dying inside because I have no clue what to do. So I, I get off, you know, I leave the meeting and I'm calling, like, all my curator friends. And it's like, How do I, what do I do? And so it was... Um, lots of research and lots of connecting with people and building relationships and just kind of figuring it out and figuring out what works for you in your personal practice. So right now, um, basically set up for etching, lithography, silk screen, painting, drawing, as well as letterpress. I have probably about a hundred fonts of type. We have a Vandercook. We have a C and uh, several tabletop presses. And so my long-term goal is to actually um, establish a residency here in Houston. Mm. I feel like that might touch on the next question I actually have for you, which is kind of as we're, we're wrapping up and getting to like the hour recording mark, I'd love to know what you're looking forward to, what some good, positive like in the middle of kind of a rough 2020 (laughs) or a little bit into a maybe a bit of a rough 2020, I want to ask the artists that I'm talking with, what's on the horizon that's sort of keeping you going and, you know, giving you good energy and all of that kind of thing? You know, I try and look at things as positive as possible. Everything that we're going through right now is changing all of our lives. It's changing the art world tremendously. It's like, how do we navigate from here? Um, And I think artists are adjusting really well. You see the online exhibitions. You see um, more artists doing virtual studio visits. So all of that is kind of changing changing for us. And I'm applauding artists because, you know, they're meeting it head on. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not stop me from being 
my creative self, which I think is absolutely amazing. So I, you know, 20, most of us have had um, a lot of the, I guess, projects that we've been working on, exhibitions, um, gallery talks and things like that have been canceled or postponed. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at that as an opportunity to go into the studio and create even more work. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, you got to find the silver lining. And so that's how I'm looking at this whole, you know, quarantine situation is an opportunity for me to get in the studio and make more work uninterrupted. And, um, looking forward to, you know, 20, late 2020, 2021, you know, having work for exhibitions, you know, and that's always great. It's always wonderful when you have an exhibition opportunity and you have and you can actually edit the show you know and it's like yeah i need 10 pieces for this show instead of showing up with 10 pieces you actually have 20 pieces and you're like ah maybe not that one i'll I'll take that one that's always a great feeling so you know I'm, i'm just looking forward to um getting back to some normalcy creating um i'm still looking forward to I'm still working on hopefully creating my residency and having that be available 2021, 2022. So, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I had a exhibition here that I'd curated that I just got word yesterday, finally, that it's going to have to be just postponed a year. And Mm -hmm. when I told one of the artists that, I was going to be working with she just was like oh thank god you know <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like I have a whole other year to make work now you know I so know. yeah <laughs> it's really amazing so I yeah. mean I, just, I look at this as a positive time for us to come in and just kind of you know for those of us who need it to to rethink things to develop you know, ideas even further than what they are. So yeah, it's a good time. Maybe we can all look forward to just some spectacular exhibitions in 2021. That's because what, that's yeah. exactly what I'm thinking is that 2021, 2022 is just going to be amazing, amazing. So yeah, wait because all artists are doing. Yep. Because all, all of us procrastinating artistic souls were suddenly given an extra few months, you know? Exactly. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, how can people find you and find Black Box Press Studio, and especially when the residency is coming up and all of that? Well, you can actually check out my website. It's blackboxpressstudio.com. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also on Instagram as Black Box Studio. And um, I am on Facebook as Delita Pinchback Martin. Check me out. I'm always posting, always sharing um, upcoming events and all sorts of things. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. This has been just lovely. It's like been, yeah, such a pleasure to hear about your work and your philosophies more. And I'm super excited to share it and and all the good energy. Thank you again and have a, a beautiful stormy evening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You too. You have a great evening. Well, that's our show for this week. Join me again next week when my guest will be Koichi Yamamoto. We'll talk about his varied and international print training from Canada to Poland, the experience of having two very different sides of your print practice, and the healing power of kites. You won't want to miss it. This episode, like all episodes, was written and produced by me, Miranda Metcalf, with editing help from Timothy Pauschak and music by Joshua Weber. I'll see you next week.